This is a Sunday conversation with Dr. Ed Baker. We're here today talking about COVID-19, the basics of what you should know. And we are just pleased to have my very um, good friend, Dr. Ed Baker, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Ascend Telemedicine. Uh, Ed is a graduate of the University of Michigan Medical School. He did his postgraduate training at University of Michigan as well. And he did his residency here at Phoenix Integrated uh, and OBGY, the OBGYN program and the Leahy Clinic. Uh, uh, Dr. Baker, before going into medicine, was in the US Army. Uh, he also spent 15 years in corporate America before he became a doctor and then became a doctor. And so he is well accomplished, an amazing um, gentleman, and I'm just very pleased to have him on our Sunday conversation. Welcome, Dr. Baker. Thank you, Carl, for having me come and, and giving the information I know about this new virus that causes COVID-19. Well, it is um, the topic of um, the day, of course. Uh, we are all living it. Uh, it is um, something we're all talking about all day long, and so um, I'm just pleased to have you here, and I'm going to turn it over to you in a few minutes. We want to just have you tell us the basics and what we should know, what people out there should know about the basics of COVID-19, and then what we can do to help uh, uh, fight this um, battle and win. And so I'm just very happy to have you with us. And so this Sunday conversation hopefully will generate some uh, questions, some good interest, and answer some questions for people um, that, have, that are out there. So with that, um, Dr. Baker, uh, you, you said you are the Chief Medical Officer of your company, Ascentel Medicine. Just give us a quick brief overview on that and we'll get right into the subject. So Ascent Telemedicine is my labor of love. It, it was the company I founded because of the, the actual health care deserts in, that we have in this country. We often think of that being in rural America where there's few hospitals and few doctors, but it actually happens in, um, in the urban areas as well. So uh, over the time, I spent a lot of time working for uh, federally qualified clinics, and I spent time working in rural America, and I started this company to give back and to, to give access to people who need care. Uh, some of the things we do, we do general medicine, we do uh, behavioral health, so people with uh, depression and, 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 and other things that we can help them, counsel them, and treat them medically, as well as uh, opioid addiction. And before, before uh, uh, three months ago, opioid addiction was the highest thing right. on the CDC's uh, radar because so many people are addicted to those opioids and we have a way of treating that and, and counseling people through their problems. So well, we, I, to have well, I appreciate that. Um, look, uh, j just as food deserts are a major issue um, across the country, um, uh, uh, medical deserts, um, uh, treatment deserts are as well. And so you're certainly filling a gap. And so thank you for your work. Um, so let's just get right into it, Tom. The basics, I know you've got a PowerPoint and I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'll, I'll interject with some questions as we go along. But Tom, take it away, Dr. Baker. Perfect. So this talk came out of initial interview I had with ABC where they asked me uh, to help them understand what COVID 19 was and and what causes it how to prevent it and from that over the past four weeks i've been giving this talk multiple times and it has grown it literally changes every week because of new uh data that comes out and and we learn more about this very new virus so i'm here to tell you today about what it is and what it ain't as of today uh, the 5th of april right so SARS-CoV-2, in his earliest days, started in Wuhan, China. Uh, and it was first noted that there were several people with this pneumonia that no one had ever seen before. They'd been getting very sick. And when they did testing, it was a virus that they'd never seen before. So on uh, the 31st of uh, December of 2019, those officials alerted the World Health Organization something was going on and they were looking into it. What made this uh, most uh, impressive is that the Wuhan, although most people here may not have heard of it, is a city of 11 million people and is a uh, city that's on the ocean and it is open to uh, travel from all around the world. 
within five days of recognizing this new uh, pneumonia, uh, they had noted that there were 44 cases uh, that had been uh, identified. And Singapore, at this time, five days after it being noted, started screening people before they got into the country. Uh, the, the next day, they actually uh, determined that this was a new disease. And by the 7th of January, it was identified by PCR as, as a test that we do. And they found that it was uh, the 2019 novel coronavirus. Uh, only a couple days after that, the first death happened. And the first case made it outside of China on the 13th of January. Uh, by the 23rd of January, Wuhan put a city of 11 million people on quarantine, something pretty unprecedented. Sure. And we're, we're struggling to put um, um, cities on quarantine here, and they did it in 23 days. That's correct. So um, in the United States, uh, the first case was noted on the 21st of January in Washington State. There was a young man who had been traveling from Wuhan, China to the United States, and uh, he brought with him the disease. Uh, by the 29th of February, we had our first death. And just a few days before, we had diagnosed it in someone who had no known exposure to uh, the disease. He had not traveled, and this was a uh, no clear source, therefore it was a first of its kind here in the United States. Is that why they call it novel? It's novel because the actual virus had never been seen before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the 8th of March, the United States topped 500 uh, new cases. And by the 15th, it had just exploded to 3,000 cases and 61 deaths. So I leave the, that here, and I will discuss where we are today momentarily. Okay. So what are we dealing with? And again, this is a novel coronavirus, new coronavirus. And it's, uh, it's part of a family that's called beta coronavirus. This is all scientific stuff. And the reason why I bring up the science is because you and I both are inundated in our social media uh, with these memes and with other texts that we get about what this is. And a lot of times people have no science behind what they talk about. So I bring some of these terms up uh, talking about them in the more scientific realm so that it leads to context to what's really going on. Sure. Uh, so recently, two similar coronaviruses have been noted. Uh, the first one back in 2002 where the SARS infection, uh, everyone remembers that, was, was started in China. And then uh, 12, uh, 10 years after that, in 2012, Saudi Arabia had the MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome uh, coronavirus uh, that came out. And it was, again, very, a very severe, virulent disease. So, Ed, I have a question. Um, yes, sir. Each of these have the word coronavirus in it, but you have SARS in front of one and MERS in front of the other. So um, explain just the word coronavirus is. I see it's plural there. So if you look at the cartoon uh, on this picture here, it, uh, they call it coronavirus because all of these viruses look like crowns. And so uh, when they did the electron microscope of these, they called it coronavirus because it was crown-like virus. And all these viruses are all part of a, uh, of a family uh, of beta coronaviruses. And that's just the actual scientific name for it. Sure, okay. The disease that is caused from SARS-CoV-2 is actually COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. Okay. So how it spread, we've talked about this, uh, the news talks about it constantly about how it spreads. Just wanted to spend one slide to mention that, yes, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, contact definitely spreads the germs as it will spread any type of virus or bacteria. Uh, but no, this whole idea of social distancing comes from the fact 
that this is spread by respiratory droplets. As both of us talk, we have uh, droplets come from our mouth and they, they go no further than six feet. Um, this is done, we know this because of all the other coronaviruses in the past, how far they travel. <laughs> and so that's why the close contact is important. If we're greater than six feet, we, we reduce the chance that we can become, come in contact with this virus. And also time, if you're somewhere long enough, you will definitely have increased risk of uh, obtaining this disease. Uh, also, the, at the bottom, you see a thing with an R and a small zero. That's called R naught. And R naught tells you how contagious the disease is. The regular flu is an R naught of one. In other words, one person has the flu, can give it to one more person. When you have an R naught of 3.3, uh, 3.9, what I have here, that means one person can give it to almost four people. So it's a lot more contagious. Wow. So that means it's four times as powerful, possibly? Um, just more contagious, uh, you know, because powerful means many things. It can mean that it's more resilient, it stays alive longer, even though they're not alive. They, it stays uh, assembled longer. I see. Or it can mean many things, or it could mean that we get sicker from it. So. Okay. Powerful has many different connotations when you talk about viruses and bacteria. Okay. Um, the incubation period, in other words, how long uh, is it before you start to notice symptoms? And from exposure to infections, it's about four to five days. 97.5% of people will be symptomatic. And we'll talk about those symptoms shortly within 11.5 days of being exposed to it. So, which is why we have quarantines of 14 days, because almost everybody would have been symptomatic and, and better within that time. So this little cartoon here is a cartoon of the virus, uh, and it shows the components of it. Uh, this is an RNA virus and not a DNA virus. I've seen a lot of memes talking about the DNA virus. This is an RNA virus. Uh, and it has these little gold, uh, these gold structures are the spikes. These spikes on the other pictures are actually red, but it really probably has no color. And they're, they have a high affinity for a cell in your lungs that have an ACE2 receptor. So every cell in your body has these little receptors and these spikes love it. They go right to it and they stick to it. And when they stick to it, the cell brings this virus into itself and the virus uses the mechanism of your own cells to recreate itself. Uh, I also wanted to point out that these little blue, uh, on this picture, they're blue uh, proteins. They are the actual membrane of the virus. Uh, they create the ball-like structure and they're lipophilic, which means they are fat loving. And um, the Soap and water, uh, alcohol, all those things disassemble this protein and make it not, uh, not dangerous for us. So that's why washing your hands and cleaning surfaces and doing all the things we've talked about in the past make this viral, uh, virus uh, non-rendering uh, non or not able to replicate itself because it will fall apart. The, um, pathogenesis or how this works. And we talked a little bit of going into the cell. This is all about it going into the cell and replicating itself. And as it replicates itself, they all burst out of the cell and often the cell that they initially go in dies uh, because it's, you just burn up the actual replication uh, capability of that cell. And as these viruses are released, uh, your your white blood cells are part of the identification. In other words, these macrophages or white blood cells, they find these viruses because they're not part of the system. They engulf them and break them apart. And these pieces that they break apart become antigens. And that's how 
your body recognizes it that is a foreign body and your body learns that this is something very bad and learns how to kill it. And just uh, of a note, if you see at the, uh, the last bullet point, it says cytokines are released uh, to signal for help. That's the chemical that your white blood cells, your own system releases to call for help from other white blood cells like T cells and B cells, which I'll talk about shortly. So again, uh, this is cellular immunity. This is what happens when you have an infection. This could be any infection, but we're talking about COVID-19. This is when the white cells have broken this up, these white cells then teach your T cells, these are uh, your immune cells, what this antigen looks like and what to look for. It's almost like an all points bulletin uh, yeah. that copies will do. That's what this is to these, to your, immune cell. And because the immune cells recognize it being a threat, they also produce cytokines to call for more help for more T cells. Now, uh, this is again an active infection. Real, I'm just going to talk real briefly about uh, what happens after the infection is over. It is what's called a humoral immunity, and this is the, w once you have it, how your body recognizes anything that comes in later down the road. Uh, and we're not quite sure though, that our body uh, will have a humoral immunity to this yet. This is way too new to even know, but if it did work, this is how it would work. Now, just looking underneath the cartoon of the lungs, you see it says cytokine storm. And these are all those chemicals that are released by our own white blood cells uh, to signal for help. But while they're doing it, it creates more of a problem for these patients. And that problem is called a cytokine storm. So all these little chemicals that are doing the work of helping your body fight an infection also becomes very toxic to your own body. It can cause clotting. It can put your body into shock, right? And most people call shock is because your body is unable to maintain blood pressure. You're, all your vessels open up and you, and you just cannot maintain blood pressure. There's, it causes injury to the tissue in the lung, uh, causes cell death because your T cells go and, and kill the cells that have the virus in it, uh, and also renal failure. So this is the first thing that happens of, of your major organs. Your kidneys, this is very toxic to your kidneys. And so this inflammation and organ failure will make you more susceptible to secondary infections. And, you, and this is what has been very uh, toxic to the human body and why people have not done well with COVID-19. So we'll briefly just talk about severity. So some of these diseases like uh, COVID, uh, like regular influenza is, is mostly mild. And yes, it does have a lot of deaths because it affects a lot of people but it's a mostly mild disease. And this is not much different. 81% of the people that get it have no or mild pneumonia, which is a mild disease. And just go home and, and stay at home and away from people and get better. That's how you treat it. Uh, but there's about 14% of people that will get this and the pneumonia will be bad enough that you might need uh, to be hospitalized because dyspnea, which is shortness of breath or hypoxia, which is low oxygen. And if I looked at your lungs using an x-ray or a CT scan, it will look really full of fluid and it will look bad. So these are the severe cases, it's 14%. And of that, there's still, uh, of the whole amount of cases, there's still five people, 5% 5 of people that have a severe or critical, critical uh, outcome, which means that their lungs shut down, or they go into shock, which we just talked about, or if most of their organs shut down. This is the part that becomes very deadly. So of these uh, 5%, half of them, almost 49%, are the ones that create this 2.3 fatality rate. So let's talk about it by age, because a lot of people wonder, well, I'm old, what does this mean? Well, your body, as it gets old, the immune system doesn't work so well. 
that's called immune senescence. You know, your it just doesn't work. So an 80 year old uh, with this disease has a 14.8% chance of passing away, which is, you know, pretty high. Uh, if you're in the 70s, it's 8%, 60s is 3.6%. And then uh, really important to see that people under 40, well, oh, actually, uh, people under 50 are very low from 0.4 all the way down to 0.2% chance of passing away. Now, what can change this is having uh, chronic diseases, which we'll talk about shortly. So where are we at today? And this was uh, updated today. Uh, the world uh, amount of known cases, confirmed cases is 1.2 million in the world with uh, 66 thousand deaths in the world. The United States is leading the, all countries with 312,000 cases and not quite leading the world in death as we speak, but it's pretty high at eight, eight, um, eight and a half thousand. Now, what's important to note is this eight and a half thousand is almost doubled in 48 hours. So that wow. just tells you we're getting, we're not getting better right now, we're still getting worse. And do you have uh, any idea um, or any thoughts on why it's moving so rapidly here in the United, States, the United States as opposed to maybe another country? Well, some other countries like uh, Singapore, they they start to screen early, and and a lot of those countries do not have a problem when they tell people to stay home. People tend to stay home. Yeah. Uh, this country, you know, we value our rights and our freedoms to be able to go out and and travel and buy things and do as we wish. But at times like this is sometimes we need to take a step back and in order to help this curve to be flattened. Right, okay. And to stay home. Yeah. You can see the numbers for Arizona and Maricopa County, which are becoming more and more elevated. Uh, these next two slides are, are been in the news, so I don't have to go into them in depth. But these are the recommendations that have been passed down by the governor's office uh, about uh, how to manage the social distancing and which businesses should or should not operate. Right. So risk mitigation, and it has a lot to do about social distancing or even um, um, staying at home. Because in the beginning, in most countries, what they do, they say stay at home. That is individual containment. That means get them out of the circulation, allow them, allow the virus to do its thing, and then in, introduce everyone back into society. Uh, but we went quickly to what's called community mitigation, and that was the social distance. That is, yeah, just continue life, just don't get close to anybody. But what we found is people just don't tend to do that. You know, I was at Costco the other day and they have lines on the ground to be six feet apart and people just don't even see that and just come stand right behind you. Yeah, uh, and, uh, my just, example of um, the people paying, playing pickleball here in our neighborhood, um, oh, yeah. there's still full-blown tournaments going on and so people just, you know, are reacting differently to this. Right, and it's, it's extremely important to maintain uh, uh, this individual containment during the time where the surge is going to happen over this next week and a half and just to allow this virus to run its course and to, so we can get back to being normal again. Right. So this is a risk stratification of population. Uh, this initial slide was, was very interesting because almost everybody was general population when I first gave the talk. But now Everyone that's hearing this talk today is mostly in a neighborhood or a community that has ongoing spread. So almost everybody listening to me today is at elevated risk for exposure of COVID-19. Um, the highest risk for serious illness. So we talked before about those death rates and who actually ends up in the critical stage. And it's, it comes from this group of people. These are the older adults, greater than 65, those with chronic diseases such as heart disease, lung disease, which includes, uh, includes asthma. So some of these younger people you see passing away 
have these underlying conditions that either A, they don't know about, or B, are, are, are there and cause such a bad outcome when they get uh, COVID-19. And diabetes, which is one of the most prevalent uh, diseases out there. Uh, also, those who are immunocompromised or those that have uh, bad immune systems, these are people with cancer, HIV, transplant, because when you're on transplant, you're on immune suppressant drugs, which tunes down your system so you won't fight this infection as easily. Real quickly, uh, we don't know much about this uh, because again, this virus is only three months old, but a couple of reports are out there and they said that in a group of 18 pregnant women, there was no known transfer from the mom to the newborn. Now, two of the newborns did end up having COVID-19, but it's thought because of the date of Asia that was noted, this came from the caregivers in the hospital. I'm glad you're um, addressing this because that was one of the questions that came through on the effects of the disease on uh, pregnant women. Mm -hmm. that are pregnant and does it transfer from uh, the mother to the to the uh, fetus yeah we don't think so but again this is new and we're learning things every day so i will definitely keep everyone posted if this changes right. uh, clinical manifestation so i use these big words it just means symptoms uh, these are the <laughs> symptoms that we look for in patients please note that the number one is fever so 99% of people have fever, whether they feel the fever or not. So they can actually feel asymptomatic or not having no symptoms. But if we were to check their temperature, almost all of them will have a mild uh, 100.4 temperature that, wow. that, that will uh, put you in a category of someone that could have COVID-19. Um, the other two things are respiratory in nature. In other words, a dry cough, and shortness of breath, which is here noted as dyspnea. That's, those are the respiratory symptoms that you have along with it. And that's the most common presentation that we see. However, note all the things on this slide, such as the fatigue, like you get when you have the flu. Any viral syndrome will give you this fatigue. Uh, myalgias, which are the muscle pains that you get with the flu. So, there's a lot of things on here that we don't talk about, but as a provider, I'm looking for to help me make that diagnosis. These are less than 10% of the time will you ever see a patient with these things, but uh, what I want you to note is at the bottom of the screen, these two words most people don't recognize. Uh, the first one just means uh, no sense of smell, and the last one here is no sense of taste. So that has been something very interesting that this virus has shown uh, is that it early on in the disease, people will lose their sense of smell and taste, uh, which they will later get back when, they, when this, uh, the disease resolves. But it is something that's very odd that never happens with the flu. Yeah, and that is something uh, I've heard directly through um, family members who have friends and people that they know that it's uh, presented itself as in, in that regard. So. Uh, very interesting. I heard the uh, same thing on uh, BBC a couple of days ago that that was being reported as well. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here's the part that makes this tough. So I've been talking about symptoms. I've been talking about how we recognize people and how we test. We haven't yet talked about testing. That will come up soon. But uh, here's something that came out of Korea. Now, to put in perspective, Korea uh, is one of those countries that has been through several different uh, pandemics or epidemics. And because of this, they are extremely prepared for testing. They maintain a large supply of testing equipment, unlike we have here in the United States. So early on, they had tested 9,000 people that were positive for this COVID disease and what they found was 20% had no symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it very tough for us as caregivers and, and healthcare workers to help 
identify people that are sick to get them home and away from everyone else. So severe symptoms, I'm gonna talk about it now, but I'll bring it back up shortly uh, in a few more slides. But the emergency warning signs that things are getting worse and you've gone from being this mild case down to being a severe or critical case is the fact that you begin to have difficulty breathing and shortness of breath that is worse than you had initially. Because this is already on the list of just the, the, the first few symptoms that you'll get, but this is worse. You, you, a noticeable worsening of these things. Uh, then persistent of pain uh, in the chest, pressure in the chest. As medics know exactly what this means, it's this pressure and inability to breathe uh, because you feel your chest is tight. And then this confusion that you won't know this, but your loved ones will, or the ability, inability to wake you up when sleeping. And then this bluish lips or face, and that means that you don't have oxygen floating around in your body. Now, this is not totally inclusive uh, list, but these are things that we know cause are this, as severe symptoms and that you need to be taken care of in an emergent way. So if you're at home and you begin to note that you're having a little fever and you're feeling this muscle aching and, you know, resist doing what we've done in the past, and that is go to the urgent care, go to ER, go to your doctor's office. What we're asking is first call. Uh, call your primary care doctor. A lot of these practices now have virtual visits. If not, I can give you access to that at the end of the presentation, but you, you call first and let them talk with you because the flu, RSV is another respiratory disease, is something that's still out there and people are still getting sick with. So you need to rule that out first. And the worst thing you can do is be somebody with the flu, going to an ER to be evaluated, and on top of the flu, being exposed to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why we prefer to have you at home and let us work through it that way. So again, if you have these symptoms, stay at home, except to get medical care when severe. When you're severe, go to the ER. Otherwise, stay at home. Avoid public areas and also avoid public transporta transportation, which includes ride share. You know, if you're requiring ride share to get to, the, uh, get to your doctor's office, uh, I, I would have you second think that because what's gonna happen, you're gonna expose somebody who's un unknowing of your condition. This is a slide that everyone talks about and has been talking about, this washing of hands. I showed you the slide that this virus is, when it sees warm water and soap, it falls apart. So this is why we do this. Uh, so soap and water for 20 seconds. This is important. Most people just wash your hands really quickly and run out. It's important to wash your hands for 20 seconds. And also when your hands are possibly dirty, don't touch your face, don't touch your mouth, your nose, and your eyes, because those three places, your nose, your mouth, and your eyes, is how your virus gets inside your system. And again, we're talking about the close contact, so stay further than six feet for less than 10 minutes. Uh, I'm just gonna touch on here where it says wear face cover or mask, yeah. and I'll come back to that in a second, because this is something that has changed recently, think uh, it deserves a little bit more uh, deep conversation. Sure. So quarantine and isolation, we throw those words around and we expect people to know what they mean, but I just want to tell you a little bit in depth what they mean. So quarantine is anyone who is asymptomatic or has no symptoms and has been in contact with somebody who is COVID-19. So if you've been in the contact and you have no symptoms, I'm gonna tell you to go quarantine yourself and I'm gonna to explain to you what that means shortly. And who should be isolated? These are somebody who's tested positive for the COVID-19 virus, should be isolated at home or in the hospital 
And in the hospital, it all depends on how severe your disease is. And again, these four bullet points tell you when you have a severe disease. Yep. So if you are quarantined or isolated, I'm going to treat them the same, okay? I want you to stay away from others. I want a mask on you when, when in the presence of others. I want you in a separate bedroom. I want you to have a separate bathroom. Now, that's not always feasible. You know, I have a lot of patients that live in apartments with only one bathroom or, or even, you know, have families in one bedroom houses in apartments. So it makes it real tough to segregate or move people away. Um, but, you know, we have to do our best, right? If there's only one bedroom, that person probably gets that bedroom. And uh, only, you know, uh, the healthiest of people can be the person to care for them. They should be masked and they should always wash their hands and their bodies when they come out of that room. And uh, limit contact with pets because pets are, you know, they go from a sick person to comfort them and they pet them. And then the, the animal leaves out and goes and is, is petted by someone else. Easiest way to transmit the virus onto someone else. So here you are, you have the disease, you've been isolated, you've been in your room, you've done everything like we've asked, and now you're starting to feel better. How do we know you're better? That means you're not having any more fevers. Because remember, 99% of people have fevers, and you no longer have any respiratory problems like cough or any of those other things that you had before. So then we will test you, and then we would have to repeat that tw test 24 hours apart and uh, they're both negative, then we can release you from isolation. So here's the big deal. This has just changed. And the reason why it changed, initially, when I first started talking about this, uh, people asked me, should I wear a mask? And, and yes, I believe that people should wear a mask, but the problem is there's such a shortage of masks that healthcare providers just didn't have access. So uh, the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease, Disease Control both said that masks should only be used if you're sick or caring for sick people. And this is people who are not healthcare, of course, but uh, and those are the only people who are not healthcare that should be wearing masks. But that has just changed because I know as a surgeon uh, that when you wear a mask, you reduce the amount of infection that you transmit to someone else and also can reduce what you receive uh, through your, as when you're breathing. So the new recommendations are very carefully worded. It says cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. And they word it that way because, uh, you know, they don't say uh, face mask, they say cloth face covering. And they show even on the website how to make this out of bandanas and t-shirts. Right. The young lady in this picture right here has a surgical mask, which is mostly used by healthcare workers. and should be preserved for the healthcare workers because they're in areas that have higher uh, viral burdens and, and they're taking care of a lot more sick people and become exposed to a high level of the virus. So they need better, we need better equipment in the hospitals and if everyone buys them, and uses them outside, it, it, be, it creates a, a public health problem. And then one more talk about N95 masks. Everyone talks about those because those are the higher level masks. Again, those should be saved for the healthcare workers. It'd be different if we had billions of them and everyone can get one. But unfortunately, it's not the case. So Ed, I have a question. So how long do these masks last? So if you have one of these masks, like the one in the picture, is it reusable? How many times? Uh, what's the guidance on that? So the, the hard part is we really don't know. And it's because uh, we never had this much of a shortage before that we probably never even studied. But uh, what we used to do in the hospital is every time we go from one patient to the next, we would often change our masks. Unless we were wearing masks because we had a cold or something, which we would wear it probably for most of the shift, uh, but we never wore it for two days in a row. Uh, and, and so what we find is that uh, the healthcare workers 
are being told to use your N95, that's a thicker mask, and use one of these surgical masks on top of it uh, to help preserve it. Because we have to try to stretch everything out because there's just not enough supplies out there. So uh, I'm coming to the end, and, and this is a very controversial slide. I put it in on purpose because people don't understand how doctors think, people don't understand how public health officials think, and you know, even we don't even understand how we each other think. So I put in the points of view here and the perceptions on who to test. So the medical point of view, that's me, that's my colleagues. So when we see a person who's sick, there is a, a list of things that we look at and try to understand before we test. Just because you come in with those symptoms doesn't mean we automatically test you for COVID-19. What we do is we rule out the most common things, flu, and if those are negative, then we often test you. And the reason why is because the tests are hard to come by. Again, if we were like Korea yeah. and had enough tests, we would test everyone. Yeah. Um, so medical point of view is preserving the equipment to test the people we think are sick. The public health view is, is drastically different. They want to understand the disease. They want to understand how it's spreading, who has it, and therefore we need to test a lot more people, just to, like Korea does, and that's how they get to understand how the disease is spread, and that's why we learn so much from them. And then there's the public perception. So everyone on Facebook wants to know if they got the disease, right? And, right. and that would be dangerous in itself because Every test that we do has false negatives. In other words, we do a test, it will tell me it's negative, but the person in fact does have COVID-19. And so just think of the danger of me testing everyone and, and not choosing the, who I test of people who are at higher risk. Uh, and then we uh, send somebody out and say, okay, yeah, you're fine, it's negative. And you go out and play that pickleball with your friends in your neighborhood. And, now they're infecting older people who then become sick. So we don't test everyone, but I think we should be testing far more people than we do. And to break that down to my medical decision tree, how I teach re residents and how I, I, I teach uh, other providers that work with me is the clinical judgment to me is the most important thing. So you determine if a patient has signs and symptoms and you risk stratify them and you test them. Uh, however, uh, because of lack of supplies, the state has asked, and I'm going to read this, it says they asked medical providers to prioritize testing to the following three groups, and I'm going to go through them out of order. The first one everyone agrees with, that's the healthcare workers, first responders, and those who are employed in critical areas, like nuclear sites or things that we just can't shut down. Um, the last one, individuals who are hospitalized with respiratory problems. So, yes, that makes sense, right? Someone's in a hospital, they got respiratory problems, you, they should be tested. But this middle one is the one I want all providers and, and people listening to think of. And these are people who live in congregate settings. Now, that is no real definition to other than it means crowded, right? And, yeah. And so, uh, it's initially meant to be the nursing homes, the SNFs, which are the skilled nursing facilities, and other medical that are not hospital-related uh, areas where people may live. But I just have, have providers and other folks who remember that there's people who live five, seven people in one bedroom apartment. That, to me, is a congregate setting. So we should really think about that and also ask the questions, what do the people in your house do for a living? You know, a close friend of mine, their husband was a, uh, uh, worked in the airport and, you know, screened people as they came through customs. And she, be she became sick and they wouldn't test her because she didn't have one of these critical areas. But here she is, uh, her husband is always around people traveling. And quite frankly, he had an asymptomatic disease that was never diagnosed. And she was sent home to the hospital several times until she got severe and then was tested and found to be positive. She's now doing well, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and again, these, yeah, these, these uh, fevers of 104, and those symptoms I talk about are the cough and the difficulty of breathing. So that's 
it in a nutshell is a lot of stuff I talked about. I hope it really was. Uh, but it, you made it understandable. Uh, you made the science understandable for us um, non scientific folks. So thank you for that. Um, I see here um, that uh, uh, you have a website, and I, uh, if people have follow up questions, um, they can. Um, connect with you on, on the website here and ask more questions or if they feel like they need to have a session, um, they can just uh, connect with you through uh, ascendtelehealth.com. Yeah, it's, you know, we are taking patients and we have a new subscription service. So there's people who have no insurance that need care. I mean, just for one uh, monthly price, we can see you and, and uh, we can be your doctor and, and take okay. care of you and screen you when you need to be screened and test you if you need to be tested or send you for testing. And, uh, and, and also if you have behavioral health problems, you know, if you're anxious because of all this, we're the people to talk to, you know, we have counselors that can talk about your anxieties and help treat them. And then we also have the ability to treat you if you are addicted to opioids as well. So, you know, yeah. have a look at the website and if there's anything we can do for you, just reach out to us. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, um, uh, you know, it's, it's almost um, the population is breaking down into, you know, you know, certain segments. So a certain segment of the population will, will contract the disease. Um, a certain segment of the population will not have the disease, but they'll be, they'll be um, you know, concerned about it, worried about it, right? So that creates right. uh, mental health issues, right? And so, right. and then there's, a, then there's a, probably another third of the population that, you know, isn't even paying attention, Does, just keeps on moving, doesn't even, uh, doesn't miss a beat while, while things are going on around them. And so that's probably a, a symptom all by itself. But, um, you know, clearly, um, you know, everybody's in a, you know, in a, in a bucket here. We all uh, need to make sure we take care of ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, um, and, and, you know, and more importantly, most importantly, do what's right to help everybody else. Uh, so. So that means staying at home. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time in our backyard right now, uh, doing a lot of barbecuing, uh, right? Um, uh, a lot of cornhole and, and the rest of uh, rest of the things that you can do in uh, the in your backyard and just um, staying out of uh, people's way. We we did venture out to the grocery store today and picked up some essentials. Um, uh, and by the way, for people listening, uh, still no toilet paper and still no no uh, no paper towel, but. Um, I know it's out there because we got it uh, about a week ago, but um, that's another whole story in that. Um, not quite sure what that means. Um, I tried to stock up on tomato juice and my uh, wife said no. So uh, no reason <laughs> to stock up on things, um, it will be there. So, uh, so you know, the, we're, we're all in this together. Um, you know, Dr. Baker, I just thank you for uh, shining a light on this and making it easy for us to understand. So as we um, come to a close, anything uh, generally that you wanna say about you know, what you see go down, the, down the road here, two, three, four weeks um, uh, from now, if you um, can just plot your crystal ball and tell us what you see. Sure. So I want to preface it by saying the reason why young people should stay at home is because they could be, have a very mild disease, but when they take it to their grandparents, their parents, and, and other ones, then they put other folks at risk like the caregivers in the hospital who have to take care of their grandparents and their parents when they become sick and risk themselves by getting infected as well. So it's not just you. So that's number one. Number two, you know, I think it's going to be a, a very interesting week, maybe 10 days of, of just exponential growth in some areas where there are people have not been in, uh, infected. I think we're going to see some of our other big cities uh, take over for the uh, the Seattle's, the LA's, the New York's, and Chicago uh, and Detroit's. I think Chicago may be one of the ones that's going to really increase over the next uh, couple of days, and hopefully, people just stay at home and help flatten this curve as quickly as possible. And uh, let's just get this country better and get back to work and, and start being normal again. Absolutely, and to everybody listening. Uh, watching on Facebook and elsewhere, we just uh, we just uh, are with you. We're all um, uh, pulling together, and uh, you know some short-term pain um, for some long-term um, benefit. And uh, the faster we pull the bandaid off of this, the the 
the faster we come back, get back to normal. So I thank you again, Dr. Baker, and thank you for this Sunday conversation. And we'll bring you back again to give us an update as things develop. So thanks again. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, Carl. And I, as everyone listening, this, this gentleman that I'm talking to is going to be the greatest next uh, congressman that comes out of the state. So please contribute. I appreciate that. Thank you. All the best to you. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care.